Welcome to Lenin in 5 Minutes. Today's topic, the dictatorship of the proletariat and the state. Before we define the dictatorship of the proletariat, let's go over how Lenin perceived the state. Following Marx and Engels, Lenin believed that the state was a result of class society. In other words, a society divided into groups and their relations to production. Marx's theory contends that in all class societies, including capitalism, there is a fundamental clash between the groups that control how and what we produce, and the groups who do not. Because the goals of these groups are diametrically opposed, there is no way to peacefully reconcile their differences. The class of have-nots want to abolish a system in which they are subjected to the whims of the class of haves. The class of haves, of course, wants to preserve things as they are, by any means necessary. The problem for the ruling class is that they have been, and still are, greatly outnumbered. On their own, they cannot enforce the so-called rules of the game. Some mechanism is needed to leverage the disparity in size between the two classes. And so, the state is born. It is born out of irreconcilable class antagonisms. Each mode of production, whether it's feudalism, capitalism, or something else, has some group or coalition of groups that are dominant because of their relative control of the state. They use the state to suppress the natural descent of the classes that are exploited. In capitalism, the exploiter class is traditionally labeled as the bourgeoisie. Thus, the state in capitalism can generally be described as a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. By contrast, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a polity in which political power is exclusively in the hands of the proletariat. Since the state is used by the dominant class to repress the opposing class, in socialism this would mean the proletariat using the state to repress the bourgeoisie. The state is unique in a socialist society because it is the first instance in history in which the class represented in the state makes up the majority of the society's population. Marx and Engels themselves refer to a proletarian state as a state in which the proletariat is organized as the ruling class. The socialist state is also different in that the more effective and true it is to the goals of building socialism, the more it withers away with time. The more effective the working class is in erasing class boundaries, in socializing the ownership of the means of production, the less need for a state there will be. Lenin argues that the state in a socialist society begins to wither away from the very beginning. However, the road to a classless and therefore stateless society does not happen overnight, which means that the state continues to play an important role in social and economic development. The first act in which the state really comes forward as the representative of society as a whole, the seizure of the means of production in the name of society, is at the same time the last independent act as a state. Transforming private property into state property in a society where the state is created and controlled by the proletariat in effect erases the need for a state and a separation of society based on classes. Since the means of production are now publicly owned, there is no longer a class of haves and a class of have-nots. It then follows that there is no precedent from which a state can actually be perpetuated, since there is no dominant class. The undoing of divisions based on class in society renders the state obsolete. While the suppression of the formerly dominant class is inevitable, Lenin suggests that once the majority of the people itself suppresses its oppressors, a special force for suppression is no longer necessary. In other words, tools of suppression were really only needed in a society in which the minority ruled over the majority. Since the minority could not feasibly repress the majority on its own, it needed special bodies to carry out that function. In the reverse case, aka the dictatorship of the proletariat, the majority rules over the minority. It has the sheer numbers to carry out all tasks without the help of auxiliary structures like the state, the police, or a standing army. Socialism should therefore cut out many unnecessary state officials. Those that remain should be modestly paid and should hold at most managerial positions that only work to smoothen the people's economic and political plans. Ideally, Lenin did not want managers or state officials of any kind, but he recognized the need for a transitionary period in the economy and the political system. Fully realized stateless and classless communism wasn't going to happen the day after the revolution. It would take time. Society would need to wean itself off of the old tools and structures of capitalism, using them for socialist development. That's where we're going to end this video. If you're curious about potential directions of development for a post-revolutionary society, check out the Future of Socialism video on this channel. Thanks for watching, and until next time, remember, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.